Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is away on assignment today. Right now on Morning News Now, terrible abuse of power. Congressman Adam Schiff is now calling for an inquiry into the Trump Justice Department after the New York Times reported the department targeted communication records of key Democratic lawmakers and family members. We'll dig into the bombshell report and the fallout this morning. Breath of fresh air in Europe, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is lauding President Biden after a successful bilateral meeting yesterday. The talks were great. They went on for a long time. Uh, we covered a huge range of, of subjects. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a breath of fresh air. We'll bring you the headlines from their one-on-one as the G7 kicks off. Cut off, 25 Republican-led states won't be doling out enhanced federal unemployment benefits for much longer. They're planning to pull the plug on the programs before they're set to expire later this year. We'll tell you the state's opting out beginning tomorrow and how it'll affect out-of-work residents. And breaking through, 40 years after the first known cases of AIDS were reported here in the U.S., NBC Out brings us the story of two men from two different generations living with HIV. Their reflections on the virus through the decades, once a veritable death sentence, now people are living long, healthy lives thanks to major medical breakthroughs. We begin with President Biden's first ever meeting with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. The Prime Minister hosted the president in Cornwall Thursday to reaffirm the so-called special relationship between the two countries. I've been a great country many times, but this is the first time as President of the United States. Well, everybody, is, everybody is absolutely thrilled to see you. A new Pew Research poll shows skyrocketing support for President Biden abroad. 75 percent of respondents in 12 European countries expressed confidence in the president compared to just 17 percent for former President Trump last year. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli joins us now from St. Ives in Cornwall. So, Mike, this was the first time the two leaders have met. What are the biggest headlines from their meeting? Well, Joe, the big headline was the signing of a new Atlantic Charter between the United States and the United Kingdom. This was updating the agreement 80 years ago between President Franklin Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill. For President Biden, who has been keen to do anything he can to follow the example of FDR, an important step for him to reemphasize the role that the U.S. is playing as a global leader for Prime Minister Johnson, an important statement as well, given that Britain has left the European Union and they want to reestablish what he has has called a global Britain. Now, there are some serious issues that these two had to work through, particularly the fallout of Brexit, the U.S. concern uh, about what that means for the Good Friday Agreement with Northern Ireland. Uh, also, the U.K. wants a new bilateral trade agreement. The U.S. has not been willing uh, to begin negotiating that just yet. But you heard the prime minister. He called it a breath of fresh air. That's a significant statement to hear from somebody who was one of the few world leaders who was actually uh, had a close relationship with President Trump. That's a big part of what's on the agenda today for President Biden with the G7 is marking a break from his predecessor, Joe. Mike, let's talk about vaccines. President Biden spoke about his commitment to donate 500 million vaccine doses to about 100 different countries over the next year. This is being called vaccine diplomacy. What did the president have to say about this push? Yeah, this is a real upping of the ante on the part of the United States. Remember, they had only committed to 80 million doses prior to this, and so many were calling on the U.S. to do more. The president speaking about why the U.S. gave this extra commitment and what it was as a statement of our values. Take a listen. Let me be clear. Just as with the 80 million doses we previously announced, the United States is providing these half million doses with no strings attached. Let me say it again, with no strings attached. Our vaccine donations don't include pressure for favors or potential concessions. We're doing this to save lives, to end this pandemic. That's it, period. Expect more announcements from the G7 leaders about vaccines today. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson announcing the UK would also uh, be donating another 100 million doses. Expect uh, the rest of the G7 to match the U.S. commitment as well, Joe. And Mike, so today is the official kickoff to the G7. The president will also be meeting with President Putin next week. I'm going to ask you, how is he preparing, knowing I think he got some information from a pretty good source? 
<laughs> I went to the person probably closest to the president, of course, Biden, so much experience on the world stage. I asked the first lady how her husband was preparing for that meeting. Take a listen. Dr. Biden, you, you've seen your husband doing this so often as a vice president, as a senator. Uh, what has changed now that he's president? And particularly, how is he preparing for a meeting like the one with President Putin at the end of this? Oh, I think he's so well prepared. I mean, he's, you know, we he's been studying for weeks, um, you know, working up to today. Of course, he knows most of the leaders that uh, that will be here. And um, Joe of, <laughs> loves foreign policy. This is his forte. So uh, I think the meetings are going to be great. Is he prepared? The first lady doing some of her own diplomacy, even without speaking yesterday. A lot of people are talking about that jacket she wore yesterday with one word on the back. Love. Joe. All right. Sounds good. Mike Memory reporting from the UK with a seaside soundtrack this morning. Thanks so much, Mike. A concerning development this morning in the fight against COVID-19. The CDC says there is growing evidence that COVID vaccines may be linked to a heart problem, especially among some young men. But health officials say more investigation is needed. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett joins us now. So Maura, the CDC has been investigating these rare heart problems for a few weeks now. What do we know about the issue and do we know how the patients are doing? Good morning, Joe. Yeah, we've been seeing this higher than usual number of cases of heart inflammation, either myocarditis or pericarditis. And like you mentioned, it's very common in younger men, younger patients in general. The CDC's Immunization Safety Office notes that there's been a little bit more than 200 cases after vaccination, but further investigation is needed to confirm whether or not the vaccination is the root cause. In a normal period of time, usually we expect to see a little less than 100 cases in this age group. Now, the the vast majority of this group was sent home after they went to the hospital. 15 are currently hospitalized, but the CDC does note that of this group, 80 percent of patients recovered on their own. Now, Maura, sticking with vaccines, a top FDA advisor says children should be vaccinated against coronavirus. What reasons did he give to push for even more widespread vaccinations? Right. So Dr. Paul Offit is a director at the Vaccination Education Center for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he says that it would be, frankly, silly not to vaccinate children, even under the age range that has been approved by the FDA right now. And the biggest number, the biggest thing that he's pointing towards is the fact that these variants exist right now. And looking ahead to the future on a panel this week, he said, quote, we have variants that are becoming more contagious, which means you need a higher level of population immunity for years, if not decades. And he emphasized this position by noting that we still vaccinate children for polio, but we haven't seen a case of polio since the 1970s. And Maura, we now know that U.S. government workers won't be required to get vaccinated before they return to the office. This is new guidance that was just released by the Biden administration. What more can you tell us about it? So the White House is saying that federal agencies can't require workers to volunteer that information, but they are suggesting that they can fill out this voluntary form so that we can figure out how many people have been vaccinated. They then say that the federal agencies can use that information to stipulate their reopening plans. That, Like a lot of other companies we've seen across the country, the government agencies are going to have to look at some options for flexible work, flexible hours for their workers after the pandemic. The White House also requiring that these agencies submit their plans for mask requirements, social distancing, um, how many people will be allowed in the office by this week, and then they plan to adopt those plans by mid-July. Joe? All right, Mara, thank you so much. Today will mark the first step back to normal for the city of Chicago and the rest of Illinois. The state is moving toward a full reopening. That means no capacity restrictions indoors and no social distancing mandates. Some mask rules will stay in place. In Chicago, the COVID positivity rate now stands at 1.4 percent, just slightly higher than the rest of Illinois, which is at 1.3 percent. Illinois is now recording its lowest number of coronavirus cases since the beginning of the pandemic. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now from outside of the iconic Wrigley Field in Chicago. So, Shaq, you're there at Wrigley, where I understand they're calling this opening day 2.0. Is that right? That's right, Joe. I hear the excitement in your voice, I have to say. But this will be reopening uh, day, opening day 2.0 here in Chicago. And it's not just here at Wrigley Field, where for the first time since the start of the pandemic, you'll see a packed crowd in there. They're able, they're able to have full capacity. This neighborhood, 
restaurants, bars in the area will be able to have full capacity. But really throughout the city and throughout the state, you're seeing a reopening for the first time since the start of the pandemic. Bars, restaurants, salons, gyms, all of those capacity restrictions will be lifted and those social distancing requirements will also be lifted. This is definitely something that many people have been looking forward to, Joe, and it's definitely an opportunity that many of these businesses that have had strict restrictions for the past year and change uh, will now be able to kind of do what they want to do. They can set their own limits, set their own rules and regulations for their customers, but it's a big day for Chicago now that all these venues, all these big uh, locations will be open again. Yeah, there's nothing like a game inside Wrigley Field. Now, we should know, Jack, the city we know was hit hard by the virus. Chicago's reopening is partly thanks to their vaccination rates. Can you walk us through some of the numbers there? Yeah, when you listen to officials, they say and credit the vaccinations uh, as the reason why they're able to do this. Not only is it that positivity rate that you mentioned before, but look at this vaccination rate across the state of Illinois, at least uh, 70 percent, almost 70 percent, 68 percent have received at least one dose. We're talking about adults here. In terms of fully vaccinated, 51 percent of adults are fully vaccinated. Of course, the president's goal, and that's a number that we continue to look at for the 4th of July. The president's goal is 70 percent of adults receiving at least one shot. It looks as if Illinois will definitely meet that goal uh, across the nation. It's a little bit of a bigger hurdle, but uh, that's what you have officials pointing to as giving them the comfort to be able to lift all these restrictions after, again, more than a year of having uh, some pretty strict restrictions here. Yeah, let's talk more about the actual the governor there, Governor Pritzker. I mean, why is he so confident about lifting these restrictions right now? He points to those vaccinations. He points to the positivity rate. And, you know, he's celebrating this moment. He said this will be a return, uh, that near return to life as we knew it before the pandemic. He had a statement where he said that Illinois can start, Illinoisans can start to feel the hope and joy of this moment. But you also hear the caution, not only in the governor, but also health officials in saying that uh, there also should be a recognition that at this moment in this pandemic, it's still very present for many people in the city and many people in the world. But I think bottom line, Joe, people understand after dealing with this for a year, they understand how to make themselves safe. You have vaccinations and that vaccination rate so high, businesses can now do what they want to do on their own. Uh, they're still encouraging using masks when indoors and when uh, not socially distanced. But you really get the sense that they're pointing at the data, they're looking at the data and saying this now allows us to open up to the position that we've been wanting to do so far. Uh, you look at the rest of the country, Illinois definitely falls a little bit behind uh, in terms of the pace of the reopening. But uh, I can tell you there's a lot of excitement. I was watching local news last night and you heard a lot of business owners really excited that they can now uh, welcome folks back uh, into their businesses after being shuttered or being restricted for so long. Joe? Shaq, are you going to the game? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Simple answer. <laughs> Very good. Well, enjoy it. Thank you so much. Appreciate your report. <laughs> A bombshell report by The New York Times is sparking strong reactions this morning from some Democratic lawmakers. According to The New York Times, former President Trump's Justice Department secretly subpoenaed Apple to get communications from key Democratic lawmakers, their aides, even their family members. NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson joins us now to break down this development. Hallie, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. Listen, this is extraordinary new reporting. Why? It demonstrates the lengths the Trump administration was willing to go to to hunt down leaks related to the Russia investigation, showing almost no one was off limits, not even family members, as the Trump Justice Department zeroed in on key members of Congress with access to some of the country's most sensitive and secret information. A bombshell report this morning about the Justice Department taking almost unheard of steps to investigate members of Congress and their families under former President Trump. The department seizing records of at least two U.S. lawmakers on the House Intelligence Committee, both vocal Trump critics. The New York Times reporting that in 2018, the Justice Department targeted records of the communications of key Democratic lawmakers, their aides and family members, 
including one child. The committee confirming to NBC News that the DOJ secretly subpoenaed tech giant Apple for the data of Congressman Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell, both Democrats from California. It was all part of an aggressive push by the Trump administration to determine who was leaking classified information to the media. At the time, the Intelligence Committee was investigating Russian interference into the 2016 election. In the dawn of the Trump administration, when we saw a spate of classified information be released into the press. They threw the White House into chaos, and there was a lot of pressure first on Attorney General Jeff Sessions, later on Attorney General Bill Barr, to figure out who was the source of these stories. The Times writes that early in the Trump administration, the data and other evidence did not tie the committee to the leaks, and investigators debated whether they had hit a dead end. But the investigations continued under Attorney General Bill Barr. They ought to investigate Adam Schiff for leaking that information. He should not be leaking information out of intelligence. They ought to investigate Adam Schiff. Schiff has denied the president's allegations and now condemns the investigation. So it's extraordinary, maybe unprecedented for the department to seek records like this. The Justice Department declining to comment to NBC News. NBC News also reached out to former Attorney General Jeff Session, former Attorney General Bill Barr. No comment yet on either of those ends. Barr did decline to comment to The New York Times, as did Apple. Uh, We should note here, Joe, that it is not clear if any Republicans were subpoenaed. There's certainly going to be a lot more coming out on this, I would imagine, a lot more questions at the very least in the days to come. Joe. All right. Hallie Jackson. Hallie, thanks so much. FBI Director Christopher Wray faced a grilling by lawmakers during a hearing on the Capitol Hill riot. Wray testified before the House Judiciary Committee yesterday. He was asked whether the FBI was investigating the role of former President Trump and whether Mr. Trump incited the insurrection. I'm not aware of any investigation that specifically goes to that, but we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of investigations related to January 6th involving lots and lots of different pieces of it. uh, And I want to be careful not. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now. So, Ken, Ray was pushed again on whether the FBI was investigating former President Trump, his former aides or members of Congress. What else was he saying about this? Good morning, Joe. Yeah, in response to that broader question going beyond just President Trump, you could almost see the wheel spinning in the FBI director's head. And he decided to answer it very carefully. He said, look, it's not appropriate for me to discuss any particular individual under investigation. Essentially, Joe, he gave the old can neither confirm nor deny, which certainly caught a lot of people's interest, raising the possibility that there is some kind of investigation into some people beyond just those who actually uh, entered the Capitol that day. Now, we know committee chairman Jerry Nadler described the FBI's handling of threat information leading up to the attack as a, quote, intelligence failure. How did Ray respond to that? You know, not very thoroughly, I have to say, Joe. It was a very disappointing hearing in that respect. He basically fell back on his old talking points, which are essentially, yeah, we saw some stuff on social media, but we didn't have any credible intelligence. Let's take a listen to exactly what he said. Obviously, anytime there is an attack, especially one as significant as this one, uh, you can be darn sure that we are going to be looking hard at how we can do better, how we can do more, how we can do things differently in terms of collecting, analyzing, and disseminating intelligence. Yeah, sorry, I got confused about which bite we were playing. That's, that's the sort of mistakes were made line that he also gave. But he also specifically said, yes, we were aware that there were threat information on social media, but we had no credible intelligence that hundreds or thousands of people were going to attack the Capitol. That remains a matter of controversy, Joe. Lawmakers were grilling him about that. They didn't get great answers. January 6th wasn't the only topic. Ray also faced questions about the recent surge in cyber attacks, the ransomware we've seen that affected gas and meat here in the U.S. What did he say about that? He painted a dark picture, Joe, of the cyber and ransomware threat. He said that uh, the FBI is investigating 100 variants of ransomware, each of which has dozens or hundreds of victims. He said the payment of ransoms had tripled in recent months. And he said that this is a problem the country has not faced before, and it's only going to get worse. And of course, he urged companies that are hit by ransomware to immediately call the FBI, uh, because recall that Colonial Pipeline did that, and the FBI was able to trace and claw back some of the Bitcoin ransom 
that Colonial Pipeline paid to free its data, Joe. Yeah, that was a major development this week. I mean, does the FBI say if you notify us quickly, perhaps there is something we can do to try and recoup some of this? 100 percent. That's the model. They were they were able to trace the Bitcoin as it as it roamed the world through different Bitcoin wallets. And at the end of the day, it reached a place where the FBI used a legal process and perhaps some some spy craft to claw it back. And they got most of the ransom back at Colonial Pay, Joe. All right. Ken Delaney and Ken, thanks so much. Time for a check on your morning news now. Weather Bill Cairns is with us on this Friday morning, and it's finally cooling down, at least here out east. <laughs> How are you doing, Bill? <laughs> it, good. Yeah, man, he's got me all confused. Bitcoin wallets. You know, I didn't think they went in a wallet, but then they call them a wallet. Yeah. I, 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 I don't get it either. So, yeah, Bitcoin don't ask thing. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was hoping you just join me in the confusion. But uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get into this forecast and then we'll get you through the weekend. We do have some issues, uh, in some areas too much rain. Other areas we're desperate. and We would love it to rain, but it just won't. So we have drought and heat wave to talk about. So the problem areas today, we still have a tiny bit of rain left in Mississippi. And we've had you know, days of flooding there. And today we're really focusing on the areas of the mid-Atlantic. So we have a flash flood watch that includes 13 million people. And you notice we go all the way from Norfolk to London, Kentucky, including almost all of the state of Virginia and West Virginia, and everywhere south of Washington, D.C., and north of Raleigh. Those are the areas of concern. We got nailed yesterday with heavy rain, and we're going to do it again this afternoon. We're expecting two to three inches of rain. It should be mostly during the evening rush hour, too. So anyone driving from Raleigh, uh, to Richmond up 95, Fredericksburg to D.C. That could be a long haul later on this afternoon. We already have a couple areas with flash flood warnings. And here's the rainfall forecast. Areas in yellow is up to one to two inches of rain. And as we focus and zoom in here to the mid-Atlantic region, that's where we're going to see the heaviest rainfall, really highlighting south of D.C., down through Roanoke Rapids, Norfolk, and out towards the Outer Banks. And here's kind of how the timing on all this plays out. You notice by about 8 p.m., we're dry, Philly, New York, northwards. All that rain is really Raleigh to D.C., as I mentioned. Not bad in areas of the Great Lakes today, too. And then on Saturday, whatever wet weather is kind of left of this storm system will be down in the Carolinas. It'll only be an afternoon rain, so don't go canceling your beach plans or whatever else. Just keep an eye to the sky later in the day. And we mentioned the heat. This is going to be a pretty epic heat wave in the desert southwest over the next couple of days. 18 million people impacted. Today we're at 106. And it gets much hotter as we head towards the upcoming weekend forecast with near record highs in the southwest. Pretty beautiful Saturday in the northeast. But do watch out. We will have a few afternoon storms to dodge come Sunday afternoon. But it looks like about 113 on Sunday. Once Phoenix gets above about 112, that's when it starts getting a little unusual in the summer. <laughs> Until then, it's totally fine. Totally just a dry heat. Yeah, totally normal. <laughs> All right. Thank you, yes, Bill. Exactly. I appreciate it. See you next hour. Coming up, to pay or not to pay, how America's schools, businesses, even cities are responding to the frightening influx of ransomware attacks. That story next. The world's largest meat producer, JBS, paid an $11 million ransom to cyber attackers. Many of the nation's schools face similar threats, but with much tighter budgets. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello is in New Orleans with a closer look at their dilemma. Meatpacker JBS, just the latest big company to pay a ransom, $11 million in Bitcoin. After cyber criminals knocked out plants that process 20% of America's meat supply. To pay or not to pay is the dilemma all ransomware targets face. The small Newhall School District in California was attacked last fall. Teacher payroll, grades, and lesson plans locked up for nearly two weeks as hackers demanded big money. There is no school district that is in position we don't operate with lush funds that are just sitting around. With school systems strapped for cash and little money for cybersecurity, students' personal information can be vulnerable. IBM Security X-Force calculates 1,700 schools and colleges were hit by ransomware last year, even more this year. They don't have the expertise to respond to these type of incidents, but still, they're getting targeted again and again. The company recently awarded six school districts half a million dollars each to beef up their cybersecurity defenses. 7,800 applied. Meanwhile, cities, large and small, are also under daily attack. 
Here in New Orleans, it took nine months last year for the city to recover from a ransomware attack that for a while put police, fire, and public works back on pen and paper. Fortunately, the mayor says critical financial data was protected in the cloud. Did you consider paying the ransom? No, we did not consider uh, paying the ransom because we were able to stop it in its tracks. And we were able uh, to beat back the um, compromise. But in many cities, businesses, hospitals, and school districts have paid. Superintendent Pelzel can't say what his school district did to regain control of their computers and lesson plans. You're talking about five to 12 year olds and shutting down their learning. Cyber pros are urging the country to double down on security. Change all of your passwords regularly. Use multi-step authentication. Back up your computers offline or to the cloud. Never skip a security update. Hire a cybersecurity staff if you can. And remind employees and family members, never click on suspect emails or links. Tom Costello, NBC News, New Orleans. Across America, businesses are experiencing a worker shortage, and many of the essential and seasonal workers they need are immigrants. Now, some groups like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce are calling on the Biden administration to double the quota on highly skilled and seasonal workers to try and address the problem. CEO of Voto Latino, Maria Teresa, Teresa Kumar, joins us now. Maria, good morning. Good to have you with us. You know, as we've been reporting, the service industry is facing this huge worker shortage right now. What have you seen with how visas play into this, and what does that tell Tell you. Well, one of the largest shortages we're seeing is in the Silicon Valley area and the tech industry area, where H-1B visas, if folks recall, were basically stopped under Trump. And so they're trying to get them back into into the uh, into the right place. And that's one of the reasons why the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is asking the Biden administration to come out and modernize a lot of these visas. But more importantly, roll back some of the restrictions that were placed under the Trump administration. That's one thing that happened. Also, one of the things that we witnessed under was that under Trump, because he was so hostile to uh, to immigration in general, regardless of skilled labor, you saw a lot of highly skilled individuals going elsewhere. We saw a lot of individuals going into India, going into China, excuse me, uh, from India going into China. They were going into European countries. And so now it's a matter of catching up and making sure that we recognize that one of our strengths as this country is providing a fair immigration system, providing employment for the skills that we need. And that is a, basically a mixed school, a mixed toolbox of skills, whether we're talking about the service industry or we're talking about high tech. So looking at the current administration, I mean, what are some of the tangible things that you think President Biden can do to try and fix this, especially with the country reopening so quickly right now with so many people traveling for a lot of businesses? The need is pretty urgent. One of the things that he's started to do is engagement. He's been talking to individuals active in the immigration visa space, and that is not your traditional activist. We're talking about the activists, but also the business community. He is rolling back some of the inf some of the restrictions that were placed on these immigration uh, visas before, and he is modernizing some of it uh, in the way that I shared before. What are the skills that we need today to make sure that our economy is thriving, making sure that we have a fair and just immigration system. And part of it is also just having a conversation around. Right now, you're looking live at images from the G7 summit in Cornwall in the United Kingdom, where just moments ago, the so-called family photo took place, where the leaders of the seven nations gathering all post for a picture together. Of course, they're going to be meeting this weekend. It kicks off today, focusing on a number of issues, climate change, cyber attacks, response to the pandemic, including vaccine distribution, especially to poorer countries, with the U.S. pledging half a billion vaccines over the course of the next year to more than 100 countries. They plan to endorse a global minimum corporate tax of 15 percent that will impact multinational corporations. And really, overall, this is meant to really send a message about the power of democratic institutions. And for President Biden, you see there a chance to talk about, offer a contrast to the former president, President Trump, who had an America first policy. We'll continue in coverage of the G7 summit throughout the day. Jeopardy! champion turned guest host Ken Jennings has been showing his support for Pride Month in his front yard with a 12-foot skeleton 
covered in rainbow flags. The 47-year-old posted this photo on Twitter showing the Home Depot skeleton, which first went viral last Halloween. Now it's adorned with rainbow flags, windmills, and banners saying, Love Wins. The picture was captioned, Tim Burton's Corpse Pride. Instead of bride, get it? They created movie puns for $2,000. All right, moving on, the Florida State Board of Education unanimously voted yesterday to ban critical race theory from the classroom. It's one of several states to restrict students from learning about systemic racism. NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce explains what critical race theory is and why the issue is so controversial. Some Ohio lawmakers want to ban what is known as critical race theory. Governor Kemp pushing back against teaching critical race theory in Georgia schools. CRT is not an honest dialogue. Republican lawmakers and some concerned parents are waging war against critical race theory and its role in the classroom today. It's a 40-year-old academic framework based on the concept that racism impacts our legal and social systems. So is the outrage an overreaction or is it justified? I teach critical race theory throughout my class, or at least I bring the sensibilities. Dr. LaToya Baldwin-Clark teaches law at UCLA's Critical Race Studies program. She says these are some of the basic themes of critical race theory. Race is not real, but racism is. Racism is ordinary and baked into our institutions and systems. Not all groups experience racism the same way. Whiteness comes with material and psychological benefits. But the uproar over CRT these days isn't really directed at college-level professors like Dr. Baldwin-Clark, necessarily. It's aimed at K-12 classrooms. After the summer of social unrest, CRT ideas are appearing in grade school lesson plans. That's sparking backlash from conservatives and some liberals who claim this actually creates more division among younger students. What we see now, though, is kind of a bastardization of critical race theory. Dr. Eric Smith is an associate professor of rhetoric at York College of Pennsylvania. He's been speaking out against CRT. I think it's a travesty to tell kids especially, right, that because of this systemic racism, you're going to always have it hard. But unlike other critics, Dr. Smith doesn't support invoking CRT as a way to censor honest conversations about race. Unfortunately, there are people um, on the right with their agendas and see this as an opportunity to squelch uh, discussion about race, period. And that's not good. It's past time for America to discard the left-wing myth of systemic racism. From Texas to Ohio, Republican lawmakers in at least six states are turning their animus into action, introducing measures that limit how schools can teach historical truths about racism. A lot of these laws don't explicitly mention critical race theory, but instead use broad language to define what is and isn't acceptable. Take Kentucky, for example. Republican State Representative Joseph Fisher recently pre-filed a bill that would ban concepts teaching that an individual is, quote, inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. Another line says you can't refer to the United States as, quote, fundamentally or irredeemably racist or sexist. In Oklahoma, Governor signed a bill into law that bans lessons, including the concept that one should feel discomfort, guilt, or stress on account of their race or sex. The discourse is critical race theory teaches our children to think that white people are evil. And that's not the case. We are not teaching white children that they are oppressors or that they are bad or that they should feel guilty. What we are doing is we are um, actually making our pedagogy more critical so that all of our children understand how we got to where we are today. Republicans are also leading a movement on the national front, arguing the mere mention of systemic racism is racist. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton's Combating Racist Training in the Military Act already has the support of 30 GOP representatives. The Stop CRT Act would essentially codify former President Donald Trump's executive order banning diversity and racial equity training for federal employees. I, I don't believe in banning CRT. I think that's a wrong move. I think what we need to ban is saying that CRT is the end all be all truth. Um, it should be a lens through which we can see the world right? It shouldn't be the lens. The efforts to ban CRT have put conservatives directly at odds with educators and Democrats who are concerned that the laws are just whitewashing history. 
During a recent press conference in Kentucky, Democratic Governor Andy Beshear expressed concern about the bill proposed in his state. I think once you start legislating what can and can't be taught in in schools, um, it, it, especially in the framework of politics, it gets really dangerous. And the Oklahoma City Board of Education unanimously denounced the bill just passed in their state, with one board member describing it as an insult. I honestly don't see the laws themselves um, being particularly um, effective. These laws may not have teeth in the classroom, but they could deliver political gains at the ballot box. Tweets like this one from Christopher Rufo, one of the right's most outspoken critics of CRT, suggest a broad and somewhat confusing definition of the concept is exactly the point, especially as many conservatives look to rally voters around culture wars like this one ahead of next year's midterms. Coming up, a group of Republican-led states will withdraw from federal unemployment programs starting tomorrow. Will the move push jobless residents to re-enter the workforce? We're going to take a closer look coming up. You're looking live right now at a classroom in the UK where you can see the First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, and the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate Middleton, are together right now. They're actually meeting with students and teachers inside a classroom, about 30 kids who are four to five years old. They'll be taking part in a panel discussion focused on early childhood education. As part of the trip, we're told they're also going to be heading outside to visit a couple of bunnies that are cared for by the kids. This, of course, just part of President Biden's tour overseas visiting with the prime minister in UK yesterday and then the G7 summit about to kick off there. Tomorrow, four Republican-led states are expected to end those enhanced federal unemployment benefits that were offered because of the pandemic. Government officials in Alaska, Iowa, Missouri, and Mississippi hope the move will force more people to go back to work as the country struggles with widespread labor shortages. Will it work? NBC News senior business reporter Ben Popkin takes a closer look. The country is about to embark on a bold mass social and economic experiment. Will cutting off federal benefits early for half the country prod people in those states back to work? Businesses have been complaining they can't find enough workers to serve tables, make beds, and man factory equipment. They say the government is paying people more to not work than they can afford to pay them to work, and they can't compete. Combined federal and state unemployment benefits equal an average of about $650 a week, or $16 an hour for full-time work. That's more than some of these entry-level jobs are offering. The CARES Act in March 2020 provided a $300 a week federal supplement on top of regular state unemployment benefits. The American Rescue Plan extended them through Labor Day. Those extended benefits are what these states are now ending. But cutting off this support will impact real people. And those who have been living on unemployment say they've got other reasons they can't go back to work, like virus concerns or child care. Sherry Pratt of New Hampshire is an unemployed print market marketing sales rep, and her daughter has special needs. The state will cut off the federal expansion for her on June 19th. And I can't get a job right now. I can't find care for my daughter. She requires some special care. I can't find anybody to care for her if I were to go out and get a full-time job. The family is down to a single income. Her husband works in a warehouse. She's been sending out resumes since being laid off right before the pandemic, but says the only jobs open are entry-level hourly ones. There are not a lot of jobs available in my field. You know, for me to go out even from nine to one and get a job that is going to pay, what, $12 an hour? I don't think there's a labor shortage. I think there's a living wage labor shortage. The Century Foundation estimates that 4 million will lose their benefits for a total of $22 billion. According to a recent study from the Federal Reserve, if there's 20 unemployed people with these benefits in place, six workers per month will find a job. If the benefits were taken away, seven workers would find a job. So that's the impact. What happens to the other 21 workers in either scenario? They need something to get by on, to pay their bills, to put gas in their car so they can look for a job, 
And that's what's being cut off. These governors are essentially uh, cutting off their nose to spite their face. If benefits were preventing workers from applying, you would expect to see job search activity rising in the states that are cutting them off. So far, that hasn't happened. Just look at this chart from Indeed. We'll see if things change after the benefits run out. Experts say we haven't faced up to the fact that we are in the midst of a great labor force reallocation accelerated by the pandemic, where many people may need to retrain or switch careers entirely. We have kind of been in the idea that we could just turn the lights back on and everything would go back to exactly like it was uh, on March 1st, 2020. Now the lights are turning back on. We realize it's not exactly like that. And we need to help people in that process of getting back to work, um, you know, potentially in a new uh, occupation uh, altogether. Labor demand is soaring, but workers are hanging back. There are 9.3 million unemployed and at least that many jobs open. But Americans quit their jobs at record levels in April, hitting 4 million. Some say the employees are coming back to jobs they realize they don't want anymore and leaving for better ones. Others argue that the extended benefits are making it easier, too easy, for workers to take their time. Workers say an essential lifeline is getting cut. I have felt like I haven't had control of much, and now it's just like the bottom is falling out even more. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Dominic Chu is with us this morning. Hey, Dom, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. Well, American Airlines is investing in a U.K. startup called Vertical Aerospace that aims to produce flying taxis. American will buy as many as 250 of the aircraft, which are electric, and take off and land vertically like helicopters. American says they could potentially zip customers to and from airports. The taxis will hold four passengers and a pilot and fly at speeds of up to 200 miles an hour. But don't go hailing that cab with wings just yet. The company will not begin commercial operations until 2024. Tesla goes plaid. The company delivering a high performance version of its Model S sedan last night as it tries to boost interest in the nearly decade old car. Elon Musk showing off the Model S plaid, which goes from zero to 60 and get this, less than two seconds and has an estimated range of 390 miles, Musk calling it faster than any Porsche and safer than a Volvo, but it's not cheap. The Model S Plaid starts at just under $120,000 per vehicle. And what about Netflix, Chill, and Shop? The streaming service is launching an online store to sell clothes and collectibles based on its popular shows. Netflix.shop will sell limited edition products on a regular basis, as well as goods available at retail partners. Items debuting this month include streetwear and action figures based on the anime series Yasuke. Netflix will also launch exclusive items based on hit shows like Stranger Things and The Witcher. Joe, I don't know if you're a big fan of some of those shows, but I know some of them have cult-like followings. I know they'll be selling a lot of merchandise. Yeah, that's a smart idea. I think they're going to sell a lot of stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you, Dominic. You got it. Coming up, it's now been 40 years since the first cases of AIDS and HIV were reported in America. We'll bring you the stories of two men living with HIV, their experiences with the virus through the decades. Next. This month marks 40 years since the first cases of AIDS were reported in the U.S. For many years, a diagnosis was seen as a death sentence, but groundbreaking treatments have upended that narrative, allowing those with HIV to live long and healthy lives. NBC Out brings us the story of two men living with HIV from different generations, reflecting on all that has changed. You can watch the full version of this report on NBCNews.com today. He walked into the room and very quickly, this doctor said, Mr. Moore, I'm sorry to inform you, but our test confirmed that you do have HIV. What I heard the doctor say was, yeah, you are gonna die. There was a thing back in the day when I talked to people and they were like more recently diagnosed and they say, I'm HIV. And I would say to them, no, you have HIV. It's not who you are. The majority of Americans know you now for your work with COVID-19, but less so uh, your work with HIV AIDS. Um, Just kind of ironic that I spent 40 years of my life doing that. 
I saw this MMWR from the first week in June of 1981 that was describing five gay men from Los Angeles with pneumocystis pneumonia. And I remember shaking my head and saying, wow, what a fluke this is. Then one month later, in July of 1981, another MMWR came, this time with 26 men. And they were not only from LA, they were from New York City and from San Francisco. In 1992, when I got my positive diagnosis, they were still experimenting with drugs, and none of the therapies that were being prescribed were actually working. I did my first AIDS ride in 95. I drove from Boston to New York, the whole ride. And then over the course of the next six months, my T cells dropped down to below 200, and I officially had AIDS. At the very same time, the results from the six-month study came out showing that a three-drug combination was effective in stopping HIV, containing it. But I, I knew how lucky I was. <sighs> I knew how lucky I was to actually be able to do that. It's a whole lot less daunting for anyone having to start HIV meds to take one pill a day as opposed to what we did back then. I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, which is a little country town about an hour and 15 minutes east of Houston. I've always been a mama's boy. I'm the baby. And I love my mom, like, so much. After getting the diagnosis and sitting there trying to process it, I immediately jumped in my car and started heading home. <sighs> Hi, mama. Hi, baby. How are you? Hey. My love for my son is never going to change. I struggled on the beginning when he was first diagnosed because I didn't know anything about it. So by me going to his doctor's appointments helped a lot. And he said with DeAndre's body, his bill and the way he works out, he said if he takes this one pill a day, it's going to take the rest of his life. He said he'll live to be 90 years old, 100 years old. He'll be just fine. You know, I just think it's slow in coming to a realization and accepting the concept that undetectable equals untransmissible. They treated the low level of detection person with HIV is essentially no danger to anybody under any circumstances. I live in my truth and I walk every day in who I am. Even after my diagnosis, I told myself I'm not gonna work in the field of HIV. I just don't see it for me. That's not what I wanted to do. And as I began to advocate even more, I realized that I started having a passion for helping the community. I look at the generation now whose lives are all about activism, and I am so proud. The world's gonna be a better place because the generation is stepping up now. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.